going live. Hey, Mr. Pong Balls, tell me what to do. Yep, have a to little music. Make all my Pong Balls. Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lust, the Pond Boss, checking in on this uh, very fun Wednesday night. We finally got a cold front in here, which is more than welcome. <laughs> Pretty funny. It was, uh, I think, 97 degrees three days ago. Yeah, it must have been, must have been Monday. 97 degrees, and a cold front blew through, and the temperature dropped. We were down in the 50s, and it got up to like 82 or something today. Another cold front coming, and it's going to drop even more, and we're supposed to be in the mid-30s Friday morning. So we go from the oven to the freezer, and I'm hoping that uh, we'll get to at least have a little bit of a fall. You know, I hope you are too. Welcome, everybody. Glad to see you. Holy cow, we got lots of guys checking in. There's Bruce Candelo, Jose Latore, Tim Stewart. I bet you, I, didn't, I know Jason Nipstead's on because he already clicked like. Jason knows the drill. Click like. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine in the comment section and share this to your timeline and you'll be eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat and a Pond Boss mug that knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. Hope you guys are having a great day today and I thought about uh, a topic for today and kind of came up with the idea of talking about uh, decisions, fundamental thought processes, especially for managing ponds in the fall. So that's what I thought I would do. So now as I'm gonna click on here so I can see your questions and slow them down here so I can answer them. Good to see Jay Spires, Todd Austin, John Funk checking in, Frank James. John's up there in mid-Michigan. There's Danny Mac. hey Danny Mac. I was working on the, uh, trying to wrap up the curriculum for the upcoming Institute of Higher Pondology at our house. And man, I'm so excited about that. It's gonna be huge, huge fun. Uh, I'd written a book, good gosh, 26 years ago called Basic Pond Management. And it went through three printings and we sold out. Of course, I'm not going to tell you how many we printed. <laughs> yeah, I will. We printed a thousand each time and it probably took 15 years or more for those to sell out. No, it took more than that, probably 20. And so, uh, uh, by the way, if you ever want to write a book, you got to think about who's going to buy it. And I even have a vehicle to market it so they don't sell a lot, especially at 10 bucks a piece. But, 3,000, that's not bad. But the uh, uh, you know 26 years later, I know more. So I decided to rewrite that book, and I did that about two years ago, and finally had a little time to go back and revisit that manuscript, and now it's ready to go to layout, and I'm gonna use pieces of it for the upcoming Institute of Higher Pondology. And so you guys will know I've got two spots left. I've got a, a verbal commitment for one of those, so I've got at least one spot left. And if you know, if a couple of you guys want to come, come on. If you want to know more about it, just send me an email at boblusk at outlook.com and I will send you a brochure on it and a registration form. It's not cheap, but it's worth it because we're going to do some cool stuff. You're going to get a big, thick curriculum. You're going to get a nice little pond management toolkit with some good, cool stuff in it. Uh, a lot of hands-on. Man, I've got so much fun hands-on scheduled that you guys are just gonna be amazed by it. There's Tim Stewart, Mike Cottrell, Justin Shank. Holy cow, we got guys, let's see, Tim's in Florida, Justin's in California, Mike Cottrell's checking in, Frank James, Louisiana. Let's see, um, let me go on down here and see what we got. Jose is in Florida, Danny Max in Texas, Jay Spires, good to see you, Dick Tabert. Let's see here, who else we got? Chris Horsley, hey there Bob, I'm getting my Pond Boss hat broken in and sweat stained. That's the way to do it, man. All right, uh, looks like Tim Stewart just texted me as I'm doing this, send me the information on the Institute. It's gonna be well worth it. Mike Garcia, Chico is on. Chico uh, is, is, a, is a, um, a celebrity that lives in the Austin area that's well known for a number of things. One thing Chico is well known for is he's a kayak fisherman. And man, he's helped create a really, really cool cottage industry of kayak anglers down in the uh, Central Texas area. And he's also uh, a regular guest on Ken Milam's outdoor shows on the radio from Austin. You can find it on iHeartMedia. I'm a guest sometimes. She goes on there a lot more than me. And that's uh, 1300 The Zone on iHeart every Saturday from five in the morning until eight, and then Sunday morning, six to eight. 
So there's a little plug for that outdoor show. I'm a guest about once a month, and Chico's on there all the time. But Chico's going to come and video for the Institute of Higher Pondology. We're going to put together some promotional videos. We haven't really decided exactly what we're going to do yet. We're going to be talking about that here in a few days. But Chico's going to be here, a professional videographer. You're going to, it's going to be fun. Dion Myers, good to see you, man. John Funk, how important is clear water for bass in a small pond? Um, how important is it? There's Fred Bingaman. Hi, Fred. Debbie and I were talking about you guys over the weekend. We have got to get together sooner rather than later. Victor Moberg, John Wilson. Hey, John, from Ohio. Um, how important is clear water for bass in a small pond? Well, let me tell you this. Bass are sight feeders, and they thrive better when they can see. You know, the, the downside to clear water is clear water is typically sterile water. However, there's some management strategies now where we can extract nutrients from the water to clear it up, convert those nutrients more to paraphyton and plankton and biofilm where critters can eat it that other fish can eat and still keep it up. You've seen uh, Bruce Kanya on this show several times and Bruce is the go-to guy for that kind of knowledge. It, it, what it means is expanding the volume of, of uh, substrate that bacteria can grow on. And Bruce does it with floating islands. And I've actually been able to help to uh, create some lakes to where we could add a bunch of that structure, the, the substrate that bacteria can grow on. So here's the bottom line. Bass need to be able to see to eat to be most efficient. However, I can't tell you how many times I've worked on muddy lakes where it's really interesting. There's this, there's this biological concept called plasticity where fish can adjust to their environment. Like for example, you can take a bass from a stream and like this, people do this in Missouri fairly often where there's a really nice clear stream. They'll catch a bass in that stream or bluegill in that stream and move them to their ponds. They never make it because they grew up in that environment and they've adjusted that environment. Bass will do the same thing in muddy water or water that's not clear. You know, now it won't be many. You can't have as many bass in a muddy pond as you can in a clear pond. But the trade-off is that water with some turbidity that's associated with productivity, like a plankton bloom, those are the ponds that grow the most biomass and can support more bass. So a visibility that say this time of year, 18 to 30 inches is prime. That's real good, that's plenty of room because what happens, here's what the bass do. Uh, John, bass will, first, their lateral lines are connected to their brains. The lateral line is a hollow tube full of gas. And when there's movement in the water, fish can detect it, a bass can detect it, a bluegill can detect it because the waves and the movement of the water, they can sense it with their lateral lines. And then with repeated occurrences, they get conditioned to go investigate the movement, even if they can't see it. So they'll swim toward the movement that they can sense with their lateral line. And then when they get close enough, they can see, then they'll choose instinctively whether or not to eat whatever that is or run away from it so they don't get eaten. So there you go. Dick Tabert. Wish I could work it out, Bob, maybe next time. Well, there's another one coming up, Dick, in, uh, uh, April, two, three, four, I believe it is, so next spring. And if those two work, then I'm, I'll do it again. You know, if we get enough folks that want to play, and like John Wilson, for example, if you wanted to send an employee down to expand your fishery side of your business, man, this would be a great one to, 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 to do where uh, we could do it. Hi, back to John. Go Cards, yeah, there you go. Cards 13, Braves 1, 7th inning. Well, you know what? Well, I think that series is tied, isn't it? Danny Mac, one tenth acre, two and a half years old. My buddy and I are mucking it with a trash pump and slotted PVC suction head. It's working great. Here's your question: Is it uh, is it causing the mud to be stirred up in the water? Is your water getting cloudy? That's my question for you, Danny Mac. So send that back. Uh, Jason Nip said our eel, our eel grass is getting covered with algae, looking particles, likely blocking the sun. What are your thoughts on this? Grass was green, now it looks brown. Well, if it's brown, it's one of two things. It's either dirt that's settling out of the lake or it's paraphyte growing on it. But I'll tell you what I would do. This sounds a little goofy, but I'd take a broom 
and I'd go out there and, and swirl the water around around it and see if it washes off. If it washes off, it's dirt. However, that will not totally inhibit that plant from thriving. It will just slow it down, and odds are that it's getting ready to go dormant. You know, the, the big thing for you, Jason, was to get it established. So if you've got it established, odds are high that it's going to come back next year if it's got a good root base going. But I would, I'd get out there in the boat and sweep around it and see if you can sweep it off. If it sweeps off, it's dirt. If it doesn't, it's paraphyton. If it's paraphyton, it's not that big a deal. All right, Bill Russell. Sorry I'm late, I was fishing. Hey, rub it in, dude. I was fishing, he says. <laughs> well, why are you here if you could be fishing? <laughs> All right, let's see. Danny Mac says, this after gobs of bacteria and enzymes followed by flocculent. Nasty, thick, black, laden water. Okay, let's talk about that. That's a great observation. So what Danny Mac is doing is he's had um, some issues with organic matter in the bottom of his pond. So what he did was he added some bacteria and enzymes. And if I recall, Danny Mac, you've got an aeration system. What that did was is the aeration system kept the water moving and the bacteria and the enzymes worked to decompose that organic matter, whether it's leaves or you know grass clippings or fish waste or dead aquatic plants. So what's going on now, that stuff is settled to the bottom and what Danny Mac is doing is with the bacteria is kind of trying to thin it out. So now he's got a trash pump and he's sucking that black gooey stuff off of the bottom. So nasty, thick, black laden water. I got a feeling you're gonna have to move the intake of that pump around because you'll clean out one area, then you'll need to move it and clean it out again. But still going back to my question, I'd like to know if uh, the water's muddy or turbid. Is it causing the water to be turbid? It's, it, 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 it probably isn't, but I still like to know that. Jay Spires from Charlotte, North Cackalack. We should be closing on the property I mentioned weeks ago in Floyd, Virginia. Got the soil study back. I have no clue how to read most of the findings. Can I email it to you for your opinion? Sure. Email it to me at boblusk at, pond, uh, at uh, uh, outlook.com. Boblusk at outlook.com. Or you can send it to info at pondboss.com. Matter of fact, send it to info at pondboss.com. Been told it's good to build a pond through Golder Acre. We're buying the property for the main purpose of building a pond. Okay. Yeah, the soil study. Um, the main thing you want to look at in a soil study is to see how much clay is in it. You know, and the thing that's kind of interesting about that is there's more than 50,000 soil types that have been identified in the United States. Of those numbers, there's, there's, there are, I don't know how many, probably three to 5,000 clay-based soil types that work really, really well to hold water. So as long as you've got some clay, you can mix it with, that's, that's good soil. Now you don't want to ever build a dam out of pure clay. It expands and contracts too much. And believe it or not, a clay pond can develop a leak as it expands and contracts. You want to mix that clay with other nearby soils, pulverize those soils, mix them in really good where you got about 30% clay, and then compact it. And when, when guys like Mike Otto are building a lake, they'll put in, they'll bring in dirt in six inch thick lifts, they call it, you know, about so thick. And then they'll run a compaction machine over it. It could be a full scraper, a uh, scraper full of dirt because those are heavy, or it could be a sheep's foot roller or a vibrating compactor. And it, it, it takes that six inch lift and packs it down to probably two to three inches long uh, deep. And that packs that soil in that's mixed with those other um, types of, you know, the, the clay mixed with other soils and get, could get good compaction on it. So let's see here, Frank James, about how long does it take for fish to recover their appetites after turnover? Is it mostly a matter of water temperature or oxygen? Um, you know what? It's really neither one. It's more of a chemistry change. So what happens when a pond turns over, Frank, is all that toxic water beneath the healthy layer of water on top, the bottom layer of that layer cake, it is void of oxygen, but it's also full of gases and some dissolved solids. And when the warm layer cools enough that those two can mix, that water comes up and intermingles with it. Well, what happens is all those gases come up, whatever's in that water now mixes with your healthy water and doesn't necessarily make your water unhealthy, it just changes the chemistry of it. 
So oxygen may play a role, but that's not so much why the fish aren't biting. The fish are not feeding because they're trying to adjust from the minor shock of that turnover. And that typically takes four or five days for that water to become autonomous top to bottom in the lake. So that's, a, uh, that's the way that works. Morgan Tyler, good to see you, Morgan. Robert Geeson, good to see you, man. Um, as a matter of fact, Robert's brother, Trent, used to be the production guy when, I, when we did the radio shows down in Austin. And I don't know what, Trent's doing some cool stuff nowadays, I heard. Morgan works for Purina Mills in the wildlife side. He is all over Central and South Texas, and he's got a pretty big region where he helps people grow big deer and big fish. So he knows all about these period of fish products, aqua products, as well as uh, the deer products. If you want to know about feeding deer, click on Morgan Tyler's Facebook page where he's joined, friend him, and then start pouring the questions to him. You can also go to Purina Wildlife on Facebook. They've got some great videos, some outstanding information. I would do that. There's Landon White. Landon is a, a, a microbiologist from Wisconsin, and we love Landon. Landon is, a, is an expert when it comes to microbes. Natural Lake is his company. Also, Aquafix is what, what, I, what I've called him forever. But Landon uh, has been a guest on this show. And you know, this guy, when it comes, we were just talking about microbes and enzymes and, and we were talking about talking to Danny Mack. So Danny Mack, if you've got questions about enzymes and microbes, here's your guy right here, Landon White. He's a, he is a celebrity in his own right. The guy's a stud. He, he knows water quality, water chemistry, and how that stuff works. Let's see here, uh, Morgan Tyler, appreciate the good word. You know, the good word is we love Purina Mills. Uh, I was there last week to teach some at a lifestyle meeting to teach dealers about the opportunity they've got with fish food. My favorite thing about Purina Mills is they do the research and development. While I was there, they're doing a research study to see how efficient the feeds are now just to see if they need to tweak them a little bit. And you know, I've used Purina feed since 1995 and you know, 2003, four, five, six, uh, they really improved that Aquamax brand and the feed is astonishing. I've, I've seen more two to two and a half pound bluegill in the last seven or eight years that I'd seen in the prior 30 plus years I've been doing this. So that's really, really, really good stuff. Let's see here, Zach Bollinger, good to see you, man. You know, I don't know if I pronounce it Bollinger, Bollinger. There's some of each, but good to see you, Zach. All right, so Donnie, Donald McDonald says, good evening, boss. How long after you stock a small pond before you start keeping the fish? I put copper nose, brim, bass, and a few catfish. I added four pounds of fat oat minnows as well. I don't want to keep them too quick so they can spawn enough times. Caught a bass last week that weighed four pounds. When did you stock it? And how big were the fish when you started? So I'm going to talk about that as you type in your answer. But typically when you stock a brand new pond, uh, when you say small pond, I'm not sure what that means, if that's a 10th acre or two acres, but here's the deal. You really want to allow fingerling fish to grow up to the point that they're reproducing successfully, which what I tell people is catch and release for the first three years after a pond is stocked. If you'll do that, <clears throat> if you will <clears throat> if you will let the pond develop over three years and then start culling fish, you're going to be more likely to grow some big fish and lots and lots of fish. I see David Schneiderman checking in. David's going to be at the uh, Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology. David, I'll be calling you here pretty quick. Man, we need you to uh, need you to bring some easy dock stuff so people can have a little hands on and see it. David is in the dock business, so we've got some. <laughs> We got some stellar people checking in tonight. Good to see you. All right, so now then, um, Donald McDonald, let me know when you stock it. But the bottom line is, what I'm going to tell you is wait until the end of the third year. Keeping right, just go, out, go ahead and fish if you want to. Just release the fish. But as you're catching fish to release, weigh and measure some of them. And then compare their lengths and weights to a standard weight chart. And make sure, I mean, you, you can look at a bass and tell if it's fat or not. But by the third year, they have reproduced. And you're going to, 
Here, here's one of my rules of thumb. The fish that you stock originally, you want them to die of old age, except the males in bass. You want to take the males out over time. Let's see what we got here. There's Tron Madonna, Tron, Tron Smith. Good to see you, dear. Kevin Briggs, Zach Bollinger. Good to see you, man. Uh, glad I've got it right. Okay, so now let's see here. Um, Danny Max says, actually I had no idea I had such a nasty black bottom in the deep. Let me help you out with that. Everybody has a nasty black bottom in the deep. Not one person watching this video, if they went and put an intake hose to a pump in the bottom of their pond right now, not one of them could come on here and say, well, we didn't pump anything nasty black out of the bottom of our pond. Every pond's that way, every single one. The catfish and the aerators always kick up brown dust that settles quickly. My water does have an amount of suspended solids that after settling still limits visibility now to about two feet. That's with almost constant filtration through a sand filter. I want this money, uh, this mini pond to be swimmable. You know, you, Danny Mac, we'll talk about this because you're gonna come to the Institute as well. And we'll talk about that while you're here. So let's let's have that, matter of fact, let's have that conversation in front of the crowd. One of my favorite, favorite things that I'm most excited about with the Institute of Higher Pondology coming up, October 24, 25, 26, by the way, and there's still a couple of openings, um, is all the group of people that are coming together. Different walks of life, different parts of the nation with a similar mindset, similar goals, and I can't wait for you guys to meet each other and exchange your ideas and your thoughts. Are you going to get some knowledge from me? Yes, you are. You're going to get some knowledge from our guest speakers? Absolutely. The field trips that I've got planned, are they going to be fun and informative? No doubt. Are we going to eat really good food? Yes. So, uh, But you're going to meet some people of like mind with different ideas, and you guys are going to get to share what you know, and some of the things that you've done that you shouldn't have, with your paws and some things that maybe you did that were over the top successful. That's cool. Uh, let's see, Zach, Kevin Briggs checking in. Zach says, I don't know what the topic is, but can you <laughs> can you talk about perks for us Northerners? You bet. Sure, I can. Let's do that. Let's see, Jay, let me, I'll, I'll circle back to that here in a minute. Uh, Jay Spires, how long after you build a pond do you wait to stock it? 30 minutes. You know, here's, here's, my, here's my answer to that. Once a pond is at least half full and the pond dam isn't seeping and the water is rising, stock it. As long as you have at least seven or eight feet of water in it, stock it. Because if you don't stock it, nature will. I don't know how that always happens because there's some situations I've seen where there's no way fish could get into a pond and they did. So I wouldn't wait very long, seriously. Once it's got enough water in it. Now here's when not to stock a pond. If it fills up in December, you don't help yourself to stock it in December. Wait, you know, wait until, depending where you are, wait till mid-February and the further north, wait a little bit later till ice off. <coughs> Let's see, uh, Landon says, Bob's a great cook. I love to cook. Chuck Brinkman's checking in from Missouri. There's Karen Lundquist. Hey, Karen, dear, how you doing? David Fig checking in. Um, let's see, let me go back. Let's see, Frank James, Easy Doc has worked great for me. Good stuff. All right, so now Zach wants to talk about perch. Okay, well, when, when we mention the word perch to guys in Texas, they're talking about brim, which is like saying the word cow. You know, there's all kinds of different brim, and in Texas, there's all kinds of different perch. But when you talk to somebody in the north, when they say perch, they mean perch, yellow perch. So what I'll tell you about yellow perch, especially in northern waters and even midwestern waters, I've come across yellow perch in Richmond Mill Lake in North Carolina. I've come across uh, yellow perch in Lake Kiowa, which is here in Texas. But where yellow perch work the best is where you have cool water. They're a cool water species. Now they spawn early in the year and they're predator fish, which they can also be converted to fish food pretty easily as well. So they're a good game fish, but they can also be a really good forage fish if you wanna grow walleye and smallmouth bass. The, the, the hiccup with yellow perch is they do have a tendency to overpopulate. So you gotta work at it some. Now, one of the best answers for this is to have the best habitat for those species of fish that you want to grow. If you've got outstanding habitat for smallmouth bass and outstanding habitat with some deep water and shallow rocky areas for walleye and smallmouth bass, they're gonna thrive. 
You know, if you've got great habitat for yellow perch, they're going to thrive. But if you can make those predator fish that are bigger mouth thrive better than the perch, then the perch become a food source for your fish, your game fish, as well as a legitimate game fish in their own right. So that's about all I got to say about that, unless you got another question. There's Kelly Duffy, Helen and Chemical Kelly. Man, we got some we got some superstars watching tonight. I'm so glad to see that. The uh, Kelly Duffy works for Helena. He is our aquatic plant expert. Anytime I have a question about aquatic plants and the right herbicides, the safest herbicides, the smartest way to apply, Kelly is the go-to guy. So if you haven't friended Kelly and you need to learn about aquatic plants, he will. He may not have enough time to answer your questions because that, they keep that guy busy. But what he can do is refer you to somebody that's a dealer of theirs that can help answer some questions as well. I bet you liked that, Kelly, didn't you? You liked that answer. <clears throat> okay, so um, Zach's from Pennsylvania, so he likes yellow perch. You know what? I like yellow perch, too. Okay, so Zach says, is it a good source of bait fish? I read that they lay 75,000 eggs. Are they as good as bluegills? In Pennsylvania, they probably are as good as bluegills. Because in the south, bluegills are going to spawn five times a year, which means that they're going to have these rolling spawns that are continually providing bait fish for your game fish. You know, so they're, bluegill are good here. But in Pennsylvania, depending on where you are, and if, you're, if, you're, if your bluegills are fed adequately a high-protein, high-quality fish food, like the Aquamax products, like MVP, then you're probably going to get two spawns. But with the yellow perch, here's the, here's the caveat with them. When they do lay 75,000 eggs, if all those eggs hatch and only 10% survive, you're overcrowded. So that's why I was talking about managing the habitat for more smallmouth bass and walleye in northern waters. That way, if you've got that habitat along with the right numbers of sport fish, they can keep the numbers of yellow perch in check. But if you can imagine even 1%, 750 yellow perch surviving in a one acre pond, you know, they can become the dominant species. That's the problem with yellow perch. So as long as you've got the right kinds of habitat and the right quantities of smallmouth bass and walleye, if you're going to do that, and largemouth bass, if you're going to manage the largemouth bass. Now there's a lot more to that equation for northern waters. Uh, hell, we're, we're talking northern waters. Let me just tackle that. In every pond I've ever seen that have both smallmouth bass and largemouth bass, largemouth bass tend to overtake them. The only times that I've ever seen it be delayed is in a pond that's got prime smallmouth bass habitat in overabundance, where the largemouth bass, even though they drive the smallies out of their world, smallies have other places to go that largemouth may not want. You know, so when you're managing largemouth, you bet they can keep yellow perch in check. So if the objective is to grow more yellow perch, you may want to consider using largemouth bass or create the best habitat for your smallmouth bass to help them eat the to help them eat excess baby small baby uh, yellow perch. There we go. Yep, let's see. In Dick Tapper said North Carolina, they call them coontails. They also call them raccoon perch in the Carolinas. Chunk Brickman, getting some cooler nights now. The bass and catfish have slowed up on feeding, but the bluegill are still pretty active. Let me see if I can scroll this down so I can see it. I backed off the MVP and sport fish largemouth about 50% and increased the Aquamax 400 for the fry. Figured I'd give the forage fish a boost. Okay, that's outstanding because what, what Chuck is doing with his pond, he's trying to maximize production and he's doing it. He's growing some huge fish, and he's using his Purina fish foods in a program with specific purposes. So the 400 little bitty pellets, he's using those now to see if he can't beef up his young of the year bluegills that were spawned earlier this year or even earlier this fall so they can have some more substance to them going into the winter. He's backed off on his bigger feeds because his large mountain bass are starting to get a little sluggish. That tells me that your water temperature's dropped into the 60s already. Our water temperature was 87 degrees three days ago. Haven't checked it today, but I bet our water temperature's 78 just with the passage of this front two days ago. So your bass are gonna feed most actively in that 60 to 78 degree 
window, and they're gonna feed real actively from 68 to 75. That's when they're gonna really put on the mask. The bluegill will feed even heavier on down to the, they'll, they'll feed actively down into the mid 40s, and then they'll slow down. But you guys that are feeding your fish, Feed the heck out of them right now if they'll eat it. But when they start slowing down, drop them down just a little bit. Cut the feed back. Here's your, here's your bottom line rule of thumb. Feed them what they will clean up within five minutes. If they're not cleaning up the feed within five minutes, cut the feed back. If you're feeding by hand, don't put out so much. If you're using a feeder, cut the timer back. There's Tyler Cole. Got to get in here a little earlier today than normal. Brian Lawrence. Zach, so bluegills won't be decimated by largemouth. <clears throat> no, not in Pennsylvania. Here's what typically happens in Pennsylvania. Bluegills reproduce later there than they do in region south. Well, they compensate for that later spawn by growing really, really fast. So most ponds have a tendency for the bass to get to be 12 or 13 or 14 inches, and then their growth rate levels off. Well, a bluegill can go from, from an egg to about three inches long in about 30 days in Pennsylvania. And if it doesn't get eaten by then, it's going to get big enough another 15 or 20 days, it's going to outgrow the mouth size of a 12-inch blue, 12-inch bass. So, so what tends to happen in the north is bluegill have a tendency to grow bigger, crowd up, become overpopulated, and so therefore they're frowned upon. Now, pumpkin seeds are a pretty good choice. You can have pumpkin seeds in Pennsylvania they do really, really well. Uh, they won't typically eat fish food. There's Bob Wisher. Bob's also with Purina Mills. Glad to see Bob checking in. So um, let's see, Jonathan Stoddard, what's the best type of habitat for largemouth bass? Well, it depends on how big the fish is. The smaller fish need more dense habitat. <clears throat> well, let's just take big, full-grown largemouth bass. Big largemouth bass like to be, this time of year, in fairly shallow water, near structure like a tree trunk or a rock pile or a creek channel with quick access to deep water and they typically like to ambush their food now they're not pure ambush feeders like a pike you know or a muskie or something like that they'll they will go out and cruise to find their food where those toothy fish tend to sit still and wait for their food to come to them but largemouth bass like to have that shallow water structure near aquatic plants, quick access to deep water. So that's what they like. So let's see here. Make sure, I'm gonna scroll back, make sure I didn't miss anything. Oh, there's Jay Nib, I missed that. Hey Jay. Um, I recently was able to get on about a 100 acre plus lake up here in Northwest Connecticut. <clears throat> the lake seems to have mixed structure and depths up to 20 feet. The lake has no fishing pressure at all as it's private. Appears to have a healthy perch and bluegill, even golden shiners. Um, double check those golden shiners. A lot of those lakes in that area actually have rugs. Golden shiners don't get bigger than about six or seven inches. Rugs will get to be 10. If, if, if you've got those, I'm gonna have a different answer. Matter of fact, matter of fact, if you guys don't subscribe to Pond Boss Magazine, <clears throat> we'll put in my commercial right now, 35 bucks a year. My catchphrase is, you guys are gonna go out on a date Friday night, you're gonna spend 40 bucks at least. And it's going to be gone the next day. 35 bucks last all year and it's full of nuggets. There'll be an article in the November or December issue that talks about invasive species like rugs with some good pictures as well. So I would be uh, checking that out. Um, appears to have, okay, healthy weeds as well. I've caught some piles of small largemouth, but surprisingly nothing much over one pound average. Any ideas what be, might be happening here? Yes, those bass are too crowded. They're overcrowded for the amount of food they have at that size. Even though you've got lots of perch and you've got lots of bluegill, I bet you if you start comparing the bass that you catch to the bluegill that you see in the perch, those bait fish are too big to fit in the mouth of those one pound bass. So 100 acres is a pretty tall order, but I'm gonna tell you that you need to be culling bass. Chances are those one pound bass are six or seven years old. In that part of the country, they might live to 18 or 20 but their growth potential is pretty well shot. If they don't grow fast early in life, then their growth potential at the end of their lives is it just drops way, way down. You can, you can probably cull those bass and the best of the best might hit three to four pounds up there. So culling is gonna be a big deal. 
Let's see here. Christopher Aguilar, good job, Christopher. Mark Dyer in a northern pond without abundant good natural smallie habitat. What type of features are good and feasible to add? Rock lining the shoreline or submerged rock piles? Grab one of the flats. Absolutely, all of that. <clears throat> Artificial structures, you bet. If you can create some spawning areas, and i tell you where I would put those. And there's Mark Cornwell, good gosh, another celebrity chain. John Krause, another celebrity. Mike DeMint, another one. Mike's from uh, Memphis. Cornwell, Mark is the uh, is the, the fish professor, writes for the magazine. Hey, Mark, I was just telling these guys about your upcoming article. We got a, a guy here in Connecticut that's got a 100-acre lake that he's looking on. You know what, Mark, you might scroll down and look at the question that he just asked. Let me see where it is. It's Jane Nibb's question. And I told him that the, that the golden shiners he has may be rugs. And you can, and, and, and Mark wrote that article I'm telling you about in the next issue of the magazine. You guys need to subscribe to that thing, I'm telling you. Okay, so let me see down here. Um, Mark Dyer in the Northern Pond without a bunny. Okay, what, what can you, here, here's what I'm going to tell you about uh, smallmouth habitat. If you can take, now smallmouth really, and, and Mark, you chime in on this one as well. He, he's going to have to type it, he can't talk it, but. Um, if if you will add some smallmouth bass spawning habitat near moving water, and if if you don't have stream flowing in, follow the currents with the predominant winds where the water is 18 inches gravelly sandy bottom. If you don't have that, add it, and then adjacent to the spawning areas, submerge some trees. And when I say trees, what I mean is trees without limbs. Another heavy. You may have to get three or four guys to pick up a log and carry it out there and anchor that at a 45 degree angle going out in the water about two feet away from each other where a smallmouth bass can make beds not far from where aquatic plants grow. Other than that, rock piles are a great idea. Now, rock piles really need to be pretty dense with some height to them, which is not easy to do. And it kind of depends on how big your pond is as well. Let's see, uh, Zach says, I've seen bluegills bigger than a 12-inch frying pan. Oh, dude, that's, your, that's a bluegill pond right there. If you see bluegills bigger than 12 inches, they weigh more than two pounds. And that, that is stellar. There's not many people that can say that they've seen bluegills that can overlap a 12-inch frying pan. So that's huge. You got something going on there. Protect and preserve that. And if you're not feeding those fish, give them some Aquamax. If your water temperatures are already too cool for this year, crank them up next year when the water temperature gets in the 60s. So Zach says around here, streams have, streams have trout year-round. I believe that. Let's see. Chris says, I'm trying hard to eliminate my green sunfish, but I found they're aggressive fighters. They have no problem taking a fly. I actually enjoy catching them. You know what? That's, that's, that's pretty typical. That's pretty typical. But what happens with green sunfish in a bass lake Green sunfish typically spawn once a year, and they spawn in between bluegill spawns. So especially in southern waters, bluegill can outcompete green sunfish over a three or four or five year span because as the bass are feeding on the young of the year, they can actually wipe out green sunfish over a three to four year period as the bluegill are becoming established. So if you want to catch some, take some. Let's see there, Mark Cornwell, I heard that, good deal. Jack Hamilton, howdy. Zach, uh, follow up, says, is it possible to have large mouth bluegill perch, large mouth, I get large mouth bass, bluegill, perch, small mouth, fat heads, medium shiners, maybe even a, a pack or two, both male or female, to help keep bass numbers down. Well, every time, every time you add a predator fish, you're adding a little bit more complicated dynamic to your management strategy. Because here's the deal. As goes the habitat you've got, so goes what will thrive in it. You know, if I said, hey, let's let's go somewhere where we can have a chance at catching a double digit largemouth bass, where would we go? We'd go to Lake Fork in Texas or some of the private lakes that I manage. If I said, let's go catch some striped bass, where would we go? Santee Cooper or Lake Texoma. You know, if I said, let's go troll 90 feet deep for lake trout, where would we go? Well, Mark Cornwell would probably go to Lake Erie or Lake Ontario, more than likely. You know, and so what, what's going to happen is if you've got 
largemouth bass, bluegill, perch, smallmouth, and fat. Fatheads are going to go away. They're going to become extinct soon because every one of those other fish will eat your fathead minnows. Uh, medium shiners are going to last until they become large shiners and, the, and their young of the year get eaten and shiners live, uh, live their lifespan. <clears throat> so it's going to end up being a, 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 a knockdown drag out between the largemouth, the perps, the smallmouth, the bluegill, and the pike. The pike will be your best chance of keeping largemouth bass under control. That's the good news. The bad news is they're not going to leave your other fish alone just to go chase largemouth bass. So a couple of those in an acre or two of water is, is healthy as long as you monitor what's going on. Now, the chances of you having two tiger muskies, for example, and that's the ones, that's what I'd look at is tiger muskies because they're not going to reproduce. Northern pike stand a good chance to reproduce in northern waters. So look at tiger muskies if you need them to control unwanted species of fish. You know, but keep in mind, they're not going to look at that smallmouth and says, hey, uh, Zach doesn't want me to eat that smallmouth. If it's, if it's in their mouth, they're going to eat it. You'll be catching smallmouth with tooth marks in them. Okay, so uh, Christopher Aguilar says, our uh, resident Cajun says, what's your theory or knowledge about feeding activity before or after a front in a pond? I'll tell you exactly what it is. When, just before the front, fish go in a feeding frenzy. Like if if you're if you're feeding your fish fish food, you can stand out there 24 hours before a front, and for the next 24 hours they're going to feed like crazy. Then when that front blows through, the temperature drops, the barometer starts to rise again. Their feeding activity is going to stop because they have an instinctive, innate ability to know that something's getting ready to change. You remember I, earlier in this broadcast, I was telling you guys about how the lateral line works in the fish. Fish can detect movement so they can go investigate it even if they can't see it. They also detect pressure changes in the water. And that sends a signal to their brains that tell them feed up or back off. Because when the front passes, after the passage of the front, as the pressure starts to rise again, their instincts tell them my belly's full, I'm gonna settle down for a little bit and I'm gonna be fine. So what? What? there's Chris Blood, Texas Hunters, good gosh. Texas Hunter Feeders. Well, we have got some stellar people on tonight. I love that. Good to see you, Chris Blood. <clears throat> Texas Hunter is our go-to supplier for the very, very best products. You guys go to texashunterproducts.com because not only do they have the best fish feeders on the market, they've got some new, innovative, creative hunting blinds. They've got uh, road feeders for you deer guys where you're, where you're feeding deer on the roads and stuff to attract them and give them a little bit extra nutrition. Here's Joseph Reynolds. Joseph Reynolds checking in. Uh, but anyway, check out Texas Hunter. They're, and they're one of the sponsors of this show. You know, I've, I've been working with Texas Hunter for how long, Chris? 15 years? I don't know. A long time. Skelly J. Russell, is there any pond size restrictions for walleye? You know what? There's a guy not far from me up in uh, Medill, Oklahoma. Actually, west of Medill, Oklahoma. Um, oh, hey. Not far from Ardmore. It's got a three-acre pond. And his pond is about 18 feet deep, and he's got walleye in it. Now, he, they don't reproduce in that three-acre pond. But in Oklahoma, hot summers, they make it through just fine. And he's got some that have lived seven or eight years now. So I think the size of the pond is going to be is directly related to how many you can have and how, many, and how big they're going to get. The bigger they get, the fewer numbers you're going to have, the more attrition. Uh, but you, you know, the, the restriction on walleye, I would tell you five to seven acres or bigger, they'll do better. But I've seen them do fine in smaller bodies of water. Just you're just not going to have a whole lot of them that you can catch. Let's see, Chris Aguilar, I'm a witness that bluegill will take over the green ear sunfish, the green sunfish in a few years. Absolutely true. I've seen that. <clears throat> Nick Tabbert, I've seen on many occasions a dead pike with a big bass in their mouths. I've seen dead bass with big bass in their mouths. So, you know, these 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 predator fish, they have a tendency to be greedy. And when they get greedy, they die and they take their prey with them. I've seen, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten pictures from clients or people wondering what happened because they've got one bass stuffed in the mouth of another bass and both of them are dead. You know, and in this case, that was a big toothy fish. Hey, Bob, how many double-digit largemouth bass can you grow on a five-acre lake with and without a feeding program? 
Well, without a feeding program, Chris, if you're really focused on growing double-digit bass in a five-acre lake, if you do a great job, you can have six to eight and an outstanding job, maybe 10 in a five-acre lake. Now, when double-digit meaning 10, and most of them are going to be around 10 in the double-digit category, there'll be one or two that can get to be 13 pounds or a little bit bigger in a five-acre lake. Now, with a feeding program, <clears throat> if you've got fertile water and a feeding program, you're going to qu at least quadruple the mass of fish that you can produce in that water. Now, you're feeding the bait fish. You're not directly feeding those largemouth bass. So when you quadruple that amount, what that really means is you can add two or three more, maybe up to seven more double-digit bass in that five-acre lake. And that's if you're doing the, the appropriate amount of culling of the right fish, feeding your bluegills adequately. You've got threadfin shad, and at the right time, you've got gizzard shad, and using tilapia where it's allowed. So... Yeah, you can go from mm, 5 to 10 up to 7 to 15 when you're feeding. Let's see here. Zach Bollinger, really acidic lake has pine trees all around it. Yep, the thing about tannic water like that, let's see what I missed here. Okay, Zach also says, I absolutely love bass fishing. About 15 minutes from me is where the Pennsylvania state record for bass was caught, I believe 10 pounds. Might want to fact check that. <clears throat> I'll let you fact check that. <laughs> it's a really acidic lake, has pine trees. <clears throat> well, see, the thing about that, a 10 pound bass in Pennsylvania is most likely the result of a genetic fluke of northern strain bass that figured out how to make a living in that lake. Tannic water acidic lakes don't produce nearly the same food, but the fish can be exceptionally healthy because in acid water, disease potential is limited. Productivity per unit is lower, so there's less, there's fewer fish per space. And so if a handful of bass can figure out how to make a living out there, where to go, where the best restaurants are, how to get there quickly without running out of gas, they can be the fish that can grow huge. Let's see here. By the way, go back to, heck, it's already 717, man. My throat's still even going good. I'll lubricate my throat a little bit. Let's see. Skelly says, awesome. Thanks, I'm getting ready to leave McFadden Lake for a five-acre pond back home in Nebraska. And I'm hoping to raise some walleye since through the best on a dinner plate. Well, is that, oh, that's got, that's got to be Zach Russell. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. So you're going to go back to Nebraska. Well, be sure and look up old Bruce Candelo. He was watching the show earlier. You know, another uh, stellar celebrity watching our show tonight. Nick Tavern have a three-quarter acre pond and just a dozen walleyes, three years old, and still catch some once in a while. That's going to be the caveat and probably the, the deal breaker in a small pond with walleye. Even though, the, even though that pond can support the fish, you're not going to catch many, and you're going to want to release them. And if that's okay with you, that's okay with me. Let's see, Christopher Aguilar's throwing roses at me. Thanks, dude. Uh, do you know much about Zets in Pennsylvania? You know, Zach, I'll tell you, I, I don't, and I should, because I remember <clears throat> part, part of my history, when I was 14 years old, my parents bought a place on the Brazos River, uh, west of where I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas. That was the year that they inundated, flooded Lake Granbury. Lake Granbury was the third lake on that river chain. And we got to drive around in the basin of that lake, and I was fascinated with fish. And that was probably three or four years after I started reading Field and Stream magazine. And I can remember, as a 14-year-old, reading an ad about Zets in Pennsylvania. You know, and, and I know they've been there forever. And Skelly J, a.k.a. Zach Russell. Yep, that's me. Good to know there's some other people up there with good ponds. Man, Probably one of the best ponds in the nation is Bruce's. Ooh, and he's going to shoot me for telling you that. But he's real intense with his management. You know, Bruce has got a job. Uh, he owns a dental practice. He's a dentist. Where he can get out there in the morning, come home to the pond for lunch. Takes him five minutes to eat lunch. And he's out there on the pond or the lake. And then in the evenings. 
And he's always doing something, whether he's feeding fish or culling fish or feed training fish or sampling fish. Is He really, really, I think fishing is his full-time job and his dental practice is part-time. But I've not met many people with the intensity level, the curiosity, the love, and the passion all wrapped up into one bundle for fish. It's almost sick. <laughs> He's good. He's really good. Okay, holy cow, 720. Woo! Jeez, I haven't even hit the topic yet. I guess I won't. Throw me something else. Let me back up and make sure I haven't missed anything. Hey, Zach Russell, are you are you moving to Nebraska? Looks like you are. Well, they're gonna. I know that uh, Jason Epstead is gonna miss you. You're gonna miss your your love and your competition and doing all the work. <laughs> That's not a fair statement at all. Oh, we got a new comment. Let me see what it is. Let me scroll down and catch up with it. Let's see here. Yep. Okay. So you're moving. Well, heck, let us know, man. Don't 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 stay out of touch. You're gonna have to stay in touch. Good for you. I'm glad I got to meet you in person. That was fun. So let me scroll back and see if I've missed anything while we have a little bit of time. I'm going to go back to this uh, Institute of Higher Pondology. I really do want one or two more people. <clears throat> if you guys know anybody that could benefit from this event, and I know it's expensive, I know, but it's worth it. I'm telling you, the knowledge, the camaraderie, uh, the experience and the new friendships are going to be well, well worth it. And, you know, when I did the math on this, you know, we're, we're going to house as many people as we can, feed people, transport you, put you in front of some experts and put you in front of some people that have been there and done that. So it's going to be, it's going to be well worth it. Let's see here. Um, let me scroll back down here. Yeah, Bruce is taking new dentists there. I mean, new patients there, Mark. Well, heck, I better not speak for him. Hey, uh, Bruce, if you're still on here, private message, Mark Dyer. Maybe you guys can trade out something. Okay, and then um, <clears throat> the thing about the thing about being a patient of Bruce's is when you're in the chair, there's a one-way conversation. You go, I got, I, 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 you know, while he's working on your mouth, he works on mine, and Ellie's talking to me the whole time, and I can't respond. It's kind of like blink once for yes and twice for no, you know? So uh, let's see here. Let me see what else we got here. Christopher Aguilar, in regards to the acidity level, <coughs> should I not drop pine tree tops for cover? I don't think I would. <coughs> yeah, pine tree tops, the needles are not going to stay in place very long. They're, in, they're going to increase the acidity, but they're also going to increase the, orga increase the organic load. Now, if you want to put pine trees and cut the you know, cut the needles off as best you can, that would be okay. But I don't think I would do that. So let's see here. Can you talk, let's see, um, Justin Ludwig, can you talk the pros and cons of fall water drawdown as a management tool? You know what, it's amazing. I've written about that in the upcoming November, December issue of the magazine as well. 35 bucks, guys. I know, I know several of you have subscribed because of this show and I appreciate that. Because we really do want to keep sharing this knowledge with more and more people. Uh, it's just worth it. <clears throat> the answer, pros and cons of a fall-winter drawdown is a management tool. Yes. Uh, a winter drawdown, as long as the pond doesn't stay down longer than about five or six months, can be really healthy. And here's why. If, you, if you've got aquatic weed problems, then it's the right kind of weeds, which would be like, Pond weeds, you know, sago pond weed, curly leaf pond weed, American pond weed, um, small, small leaf, any of the pond weeds, and you draw the water off, then the winter freezing temperatures can freeze them out. And if it stays cold enough, long enough, it can even kill the rhizomes. And what it won't do is kill the seeds. So the next spring, when the pond fills back up, you won't have nearly the plant density that you had. But that doesn't mean it will eradicate them. So one of the cons is it won't eradicate. One of the pros is, is it will sure thin the plants out if you've got too much. <laughs> I can remember back in the early 80s, 83 or 84, I'd been doing this for three or four years, and I made a recommendation to a West Texas rancher that uh, he had weeds so thick that his cattle couldn't drink. That was his problem. 
He wanted his cattle to be able to drink the water, and they couldn't wade in it. They wouldn't wade in it because they couldn't get through the vegetation, and he lost a calf that got hung up and couldn't get out. So he said, how can I beat this? I don't want to use chemicals that will hurt my cattle. I said, well, you can do a winter drawdown. Boy, he snapped his head around, looked at me and said, son, we don't take to that. We don't take to cattle rustling. We don't take to losing water on purpose. Well, he was comparing losing the water to cattle rustling. And in West Texas, that's legitimate. So if you know or you have a good reason to believe that you're going to get enough spring rains to fill the pond back up, then a winter drawdown is fine. Now, here's the other thing that happens when you draw the water down, especially in the fall. If you draw the water down in the fall, your fish are going to get congregated. Bait fish are going to be shoved out of the shallows, headed down probably into the deeper water where they're going to get decimated. And as long as you've got enough big bait fish, big bluegills, big shiners, big red ear, big pumpkin seeds, whatever your fish are, that don't get eaten over the winter, where the pond can fill back up, they're going to spawn and do well, then it's a good idea. But if you don't, then drawing the pond down, the cons are that you could lose enough bait fish that they couldn't replenish themselves. Now here's the pros. When the pond fills back up, your fishery has adjusted to that lower level. And if you take off three feet of water, you are probably taking off the same volume of water that you're leaving behind. Most ponds, the top three feet of water is the same volume as the rest of the pond. So in essence, you're, if you take off three feet, you're taking off half the water volume for your, of your pond. So what you do is the, the, the fish congregate and then they'll adjust their numbers and then when the pond fills back up and the volume doubles, that's a signal to them that they've got new space, more water, more volume, and they reproduce better. So that can be a great way to uh, stimulate the dynamics of your fishery to gain more weight on your biggest and best fish, as long as the water comes back. The longer you leave it down after three, uh, six months, that's when it starts getting really effective. <clears throat> Let's see, Jason, I would enjoy catching all the hybrid strippers and double digit bass he planted. There you go. See, Zach's leaving a legacy. David Schneiderman. Let's see what David says. What happens to the tilapia we stocked in spring now the water temperature is cool? Do the bass eat them? You know, really, David, the tilapia that you stocked would be Mozambiques, I expect. And they don't start getting real sluggish until the water temperature is in the upper 50s. And then at 52, Mozambiques die. So, they're still probably pretty active right now, and they'll be real active until the water temperature hits about 58. Then they'll get sluggish, and the bass will really just decimate them, hit them really hard. Well, Zach says, uh, what bait fish do you propose for northern waters in Pennsylvania? I love pumpkin seeds, uh, yellow perch in the right circumstances, <clears throat> largemouth bass. If you do that, you really need bluegills, but you need to manage the bluegills. Manage meaning... Don't let them get overcrowded, which they can. I'd feed them so that they grow bigger and have more eggs, have more babies more often. Then you got a food chain for bluegill. But your go-to, your go-to bait fish <coughs> in Pennsylvania will be pumpkin seeds first, uh, yellow perch second, and bluegill if you'll manage your bluegill. Jay Spires pond stocking. I sent a couple. I sent a couple minutes ago. If no time tonight, we'll catch it next time. I'm not sure what I need to go back and see what we were talking about because I've moved on. Uh, Zach says we get about 48 inches of rain annually, so you might be able to do a drawdown. Jay, let me go back to Jay's Jay's deal. You know what? I'll circle back on that later because I'm going to run out of time here. Okay, uh, pond stocking I sent a couple of minutes ago. Did you send me an email? or Well, you know what? I can look later and see if there's an email. Matter of fact, I'll do that right now and see. Uh, no, I don't see it. Nope, don't see it. So, anyway, going back to this. Uh oh, here we are. Okay, guys, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, I never hit the topic, which that, I love that. That means you guys are engaged. We had some celebrities on tonight. I'm so proud of that. Uh, our view numbers are up pretty good. Uh, Jay says, I sent it in the comments. Okay, you know what, Jay? I'm going to have to come back and look at that. I'll do that when I get home or maybe just before I go home in a minute. And then uh, I'll respond to that. So, I tell you what. I do appreciate you guys coming. All the celebrities. 
that's I'm totally flattered you guys wanted to be involved. And uh, I'd love to have some of you guys as guests. If you're interested in being a guest, email me, BobLusk at Outlook.com. And if you haven't subscribed to Pond Boss Magazine, do it. Until next Wednesday, thanks a ton. Glad you joined in. Adios.